Last night, Leeds United played against Norwich City and managed to eke out a 1-0 win in what I thought was a very interesting tactical battle between the two sides. In this video, I'm going to run through some of the tactical lessons that we learned and see several key points that we have to find in a controlled performance just to sort of show this is setting the marker for the rest of the season. If we're able to follow these steps throughout the rest of the year, we'll be fantastic. However, bit of a warning, you might hate the third one. I think it might be a little bit controversial. Before I dive into it, though, subscribe. It'd be quite nice of you. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of you that watch that don't, so be massively appreciated. Anyway, first point. Patrick Bamford was absolutely brilliant again, and I think this isn't just a point about Patrick Bamford's performance, but it's a tactical point as well. First up, we need to say that the return to the side has absolutely seen Patrick Bamford thrive. Once he got fit, once he got into form, He's been absolutely fantastic. He scored four goals in five and caused a lot of issues against Preston in the match when he didn't score. And he probably could have scored if he would have taken the penalty. I know he's not good at them, but it could have still happened. And Patrick Bamford has these streaky moments where he will score goal after goal after goal after goal. And then something will either give him an injury or a little bit of a niggle, or he'll spend a couple of games out of the team and then he might lose that form again. But right now, we're in the good time. We are absolutely sticking with it, and I am not going to complain. There has been a visible increase in his confidence as well. Partly, you can tell, by the way, he's just happy to have a go when there's a shot on. So, for example, yesterday in the match against Norwich, where the ball sort of came out in front of him from across from Junior Furpo, most people say, OK, I'll position myself in case the ball pings back in somehow. No, he just tried a bicycle kick. Just had a go. There was one earlier on in the match where he cut in from the right hand side and just had a dig on his right foot, which is something that is quite rare to see. He's very left footed. We know he prefers that side. One additionally coming across as a cross, he just decides to have a whack. It's a very, very weird thing to see Patrick Bamford's confidence being through the roof, but I'm not going to complain because it's working out for us. But the thing is, he's not only improving himself, the side as a whole is improving. And I've done a little bit of a tactical diagram to sort of show this bit off. Uh, there we go. That should be working. That should be the right one. So this is the system with Patrick Bamford in it. Patrick Bamford up here, number nine, keeps the two centre-backs occupied. He'll drift across. Centre-backs will try and follow, which makes sense. And it opens up some space for likes of Ruter, for Somerville. On the opposite side, it'd be Dan James that is able to make those runs. Now, you might think this is basic. This is what number nines do. They pull defenders all over the shop. When you've got to think about who the other option is, it's easy to see why that's been an issue for us, because typically it's been Piru. Number seven, let's take nine out. And he plays a little bit deeper. He plays sort of here, arriving late into the box, roughly equal with Ruter. Now, this in itself isn't an issue, because sure, now in theory, you've got two forwards that the centre-backs have to deal with. But that just means that your centre-to-midfields are going to drop in, and the centre-backs are going to tighten up. Your full-backs can pull in, and suddenly, this becomes an incredibly stodgy area that no one can work their way through. So it's all well and good, Piru working his way through the middle to finish off counterattacks, but you're not getting those counterattacks because there isn't space to run into, especially for Somerville or James, who are going to try and go around the sides. But by this point, the fullbacks have pulled out, and it's just a lot more difficult. Basically, with Bamford in the side, we're able to play Ruter in that deeper 10 role. Things open up a little bit more and were able to create more chances. We had 12 shots in the match yesterday, with the vast majority, I think 11 of them, coming from open play, and that's because there was a lot more space on the pitch. Next up, this one is more about sort of mentality than tactics, but it's important that Leeds United are now going to the final minute and playing for the entire side. Everyone is absolutely giving their all, and there is one moment that I think showed this off. This wasn't the easiest match, and it absolutely went to the wire. We could have easily drop points here had things gone a little bit differently had Joe Rodon not been an absolute stalwart at every single set piece had Archie Gray not put his body on the line making that challenge on Adam Ida but after that we got into the extremely long stoppage time period and it would have been very easy to just show up shop to just say we'll bring on centre-backs we'll hold it in we'll try and slow things down and we did that to an extent we brought on Liam Cooper uh, Matteo Joseph came on which I thought was a little bit of a weird one but it worked completely fine however our players were always looking for chances. And this is something that everyone loved to see in the Bielsa era, and I'm loving to see now, because it shows that the side are aware not only of winning the specific match, because sure, shutting up shop gives you a good chance of winning the game, but that it's paying attention to the league as well, because goal difference will matter. 
with the race this tight, I mean, honestly, it's looking like whoever wins Leeds versus Southampton could go up at the end of the season, with that being the last match of the year. It's madness. And I think this is ideally told by that three-man break at the very end of the game. Absolutely everyone was up the pitch. That includes Angus Gunn. They didn't have anyone back. I think it was from a corner at this point. And then Ruter, Somerville, and I think it was Jaden Anthony all pounce on the break and just go. They see an opportunity and they take it. And we were effectively robbed of a second goal by the referee not playing advantage there, which was incredibly weird because the foul was a long time ago at that point. But it just shows that even if we didn't score the goal, the drive is still there. The fact that every single one of those players give enough of a shit to fight for it, to make sure that they are in the position to score a goal that gets us two up, secures the game, and means that we can go on with a slightly better goal difference and put a little bit more pressure on the top three. Now, number three, the point that a few people might not like, is the fact that we're defensively solid, and I think it's a good thing that we're also trusting it. For this one, I've got another quick diagram, so if you're struggling with it, I will just show that off in a minute. But we had a very scary period in the second half where for 5, 10, 15 minutes, I can't remember specifically how long, we just didn't have the ball. And when we did, we gave it away a little bit too quickly because we were either trying to hoof it out with a clearance or we were playing a slightly daft pass across the line that didn't work out. Norwich held the ball and it felt like we were incapable of winning it back. But at the end of the day, the question I have to ask is, did we really need to win it back? Did we really want to win it back? Because something I noted in the first half, I got all of my notes for the match, like in a, well, not in advance, stupid words. Um, I got all my notes for the match as I was going through and I had a quick look as I was preparing the script for this video and noted that there was a point in the first half where I thought Norwich were doing the same thing. Norwich were sitting off, not bothering to press. They didn't want to get drawn out, destructured, and then hit on what is sort of a relative transition which would be a serious problem because we know what happened earlier in the season with the 3-2. Both sides hit transition, 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 and it became basketball. And at that point, you're gambling. And when you're 1-0 up, you don't want to take those gambles. You don't need to take those gambles. And I think we were very good at sort of trusting that incredibly firm defensive structure, which I am going to show here. Effectively, what we did was everyone pulled back. We had... Seven isn't the right number. Imagine this is Ruter. Uh, but we had Pat Bamford effectively leading the press with three or four Norwich players out here passing the ball amongst themselves. Occasionally, Rutter joins in. But when the ball goes out wide, everyone drops in a little bit more, drops a little deeper, just to make sure that we are in a nice sort of solid shape. And at this point, you've got to sort of try and work out what exactly Norwich can do to try and make something happen because there isn't that much to do. I'll just whack a ball on the pitch. And importantly, I think we understood that we need solidity in width as well as centrally. So a lot of sides, when they're trying to break down a low block, will go through the middle, try a nice little bit of passing play and eventually interception. And that's where we can hit them on the break. We broke a few times, like immediately after this period, because Norwich got sloppy because they stopped having such a tight focus. But what I thought was important was the way that we dealt with their width. So this is sort of horseshoe of doom stuff. You've got a horseshoe of players, and all you're doing is passing it between them, trying to probe, trying to find an opportunity with Bamford and Ruter chasing the ball around, trying to force a mistake. But importantly, when they got to wide areas, so John Rowe out here going at Junior Furpo, he'd try and have a little bit of a dribble, discover that, well, I can't get past Furpo, and James is here as well. And the fullback can't do anything because Kamara's here too. And they'd effectively just say, okay, we'll try again. And they drop the ball in. And that's completely fine. That isn't a problem for Leeds because we can just say, well, all right, pass it between yourselves. You've not created anything here. Admittedly, we did quite heavily rely on Archie Gray and Junior Furpo being top tier. They had incredible matches. But Norwich didn't cause a problem during this period. We basically strolled our way through it because I had a quick look at the numbers afterwards. In this period, they had one shot, and so did we. In terms of output, it was equal, and their shot wasn't even that dangerous. I don't even know if it was in the box. And throughout the entire match, this wasn't just a defensive solidity thing at this stage. This was they had three chances from open play all game and two from set pieces that didn't come to anything. We were fine. And the fact that we are defensively solid is something that we can continue to build on. We have one of the best XGs against in the division. I'm going to have a very quick look because 
as I always like to say, I like to make sure that I've got the numbers right, especially if I'm making a point based on numbers, because otherwise I'm going to feel a bit of a tip. Yeah, expected goals against. We have played one more game than Norwich. Not Norwich. We have played one more game than Leicester City. And our expected goals against is better than Leicester's, with more chances to concede opportunities. I think we're looking quite good. So ultimately, the lessons learned from this match were Patrick Bamford is tactically perfect to this side. People might complain about his technicals, but they are there when he's confident, and at the moment he is. So I feel vindicated in the fact that I always like to back Patrick Bamford. It feels like there is an incredibly strong sense of character throughout this side, which is essential for any team that wants to get promoted. If there's any sort of disruption in the dressing room, then... Promotion is a big struggle for any club. The fact that everyone feels incredibly together at the moment is huge. And as a fan base, we need to learn that we can be okay to not have the ball. Anyway, that was my points from Leeds United 1, Norwich City 0. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. There will likely be a video up here that YouTube thinks you might want to watch. So give that a go. Like the video, subscribe, and we'll see you later.